We have card number zero our are with Jane McAdam Freud, artist, and we meet in London in a work study. So, Jane, are you ready? Yes. When did you first discover art in your life? Did it occur with a particular episode? It did. It did. Uh, when I was at nursery school, you know, when you're very young before school, age three or four, I remember distinctly my first experience in the sand pit. The sand pit is where you put your hands through water into sand. And this was my first experience of sculpture. This is when I fell in love with the tactile, the sensual, the feel of things. This became extremely important, the feel, how things feel in your hand. I think this was my very first sculptural experience. What, me what message do you want to express with your heart? Has it remained largely the same during your life or has undergone profound change? Well, it's remained the same in that I became, interest I became interested in dualism. You're a colleague. <laughs> well, my daughter, another, my colleague. another artist. <laughs> um, I became interested in dualism, which is like things having two sides. Um, very early, when I was a student, I made small intimate uh, sculptures like medals with two sides. And um, this was in 1981. In 1980, I made my first object with two sides. So the interest is still the same. I like to make objects in pairs or with two distinct sides or both. Sometimes I use relief. Should I get rid of the dog? Do I need to take the dog out? Oh, she settled down. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've always been interested in dualism and two-sided objects. <laughs> <laughs> This is the other side of silence. <laughs> um, yeah, so it hasn't changed profoundly at all. Uh, it's remained very constant. In fact, I looked at a piece I made in 1980 when I was a student, your age, maybe 23, maybe younger, and I compared it to an object I made recently and I was astounded by the same forms. Okay, I work much larger now, but the forms were the same. Two sides, an edge, uh, it was relief work rather than working the round. Yeah, often the, my works are floor works when they're large like this on the floor, which I think is interesting, not on a plinth so much. Uh, it stayed the same. But the interesting thing is, I didn't understand what I was doing then. Only now, with the passage of time, I can look back and see, hmm, this work is really not changed very much at all in terms of its concept. The forms are more confident. The forms are larger, but the, um, the subject matter is more or less the same. <coughs> Come on, Lottie, I'm taking you out. I'm going to take her out. <laughs> Do you want a little, um, little of a break? Or? Uh, she'll be barking now from the distance. Does it matter? <laughs> so, the world. The world, especially the city of London, uh, mounted the loss of your father. What legacy he left us? Legacies he left us. Um, well, I think this is a personal feeling. He's left us the legacy of. Getting 
on with what you do best. Ignoring the fashion, ignoring the fads, so the transient changes of, oh, this is good, now we have this, we have... He's stuck with the same thing, and I think it's a sort of message that it is possible to be convinced that what you are doing is what you are good at, what you believe in, and to ignore everything else in favour of your predilection, your discipline, your preferred medium, your preferred way of life. He, he chose his medium. It wasn't in fashion then figurative art at all. And he stayed with it. The figure was dead, they said, but he stayed with it. He kept it alive. <laughs> and now he's become, like Sigmund, the father of psychoanalysis, he's become the father of contemporary portrait painting. So he stayed with this figurative art portraiture. Has loss of your father influenced your heart? Um, you know, it did influence my art because I, it was my way of keeping him alive to work with his image. And so I wanted his permission to work with his image. I had done for, some work with him formally, but I really wanted him to sit for me and to make uh, a relief work a medal, a bust. I wanted to make all these things using his image and I felt um, that the fact that losing him, it gave me the uh, ability, the desire, the permission to, to do these things which I couldn't do before. I couldn't do it. I could only do it after the loss. So although I lost him, I gained him in form. As sculptures. Which work best represent you? And speak most and why? Well, do you know, I always think if you explain too much about your work, you might as well not do it. So there is something about describing my work, which I love to do, but I don't explain it as such, and there is a difference between the two, between describing and explaining. So, um, you know, it's hard to say which best represents me, because I change, as all people change and develop, and my work changes and develops with me, so in each period I might have a different work, so it's hard to really pinpoint one. Let me just see if I've written anything else about that. Hang on. Oh, or maybe I've. Uh, maybe it's the works that um, I know least about, because some works they talk to you and they tell you after they've been finished and from a distance, you can understand. Well, this um, work is obviously about this subject or to do or inspired by this subject but when you're making it you're driven by unknown instincts so perhaps the ones I've not yet identified where they've come from they they best represent me because there are no words for them so uh, did you work for the state mind can you tell about this experience did I work for the state mint Yes, um, for under two years, maybe 18, 20 months, I worked for the State Mint. Many years ago, I think it was in 1990 to 91, this sort of time, um, it, it taught me skills, um, particularly like to engrave in steel. I worked as a sculptor for them on uh, carving plaster for coinage. And um, it was very useful in um, teaching me how to work to a deadline, because it has to be finished in a certain period. Um, while I worked there, I had my own studio, so it wasn't as though I exclusively worked at the Mint. I also worked, as soon as we finished at four o'clock, I cycled up a hill and I went to my studio and I worked there for 
an equal number of hours, maybe till midnight, four till midnight, you know, with a break for supper. Did you learn a particular technique for your art? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know um, that I didn't know how to engrave in steel on a very small scale using an eyeglass, and I learned this, you know, to work tiny, tiny with steel and engravers. Uh, I haven't used that technique, but I have uh, made etchings by engraving directly into uh, a plate, a copper plate, and so. It taught me how to really, you know, engrave, carve by hand with uh, sharp engravers, engraving tools. Uh, the other skills I knew before, really, because I learned them in Italy. I knew the skills of carving in plaster. I'd worked, uh, I'd been a student uh, in the um, Rome, a little art school above the Italian State Mint, along with. Uh, studying at the uh, Accademia di Belle Arte in sculpture. So, you know, I'd learned most of the skills of sculpture that I needed before I worked at the Mint. So, yeah, some extra things, but fundamentally it was just giving me experience, really. And also they had part-funded my scholarship. That's why I felt that I needed to... Um, I had a moral obligation to, to work for them for some period, you know. Uh, you are a great granddaughter of the sacred monster of the 20th century, Sigmund Freud. How could you live with such a family name? How would you people talk about your great grandfather? Yeah, um, do you know, I kept it pretty, pretty secret when I was young. Um, but it was a sort of secret ingredient for me, so it fired my imagination. I felt very excited about this. Oh, this is, a, hmm, this is an interesting concept. This is, a, you know, just as I understood more and more how embedded his name was in our culture, um, it became more exciting. I found it very exciting. Um, and, of course, people don't speak about him so much, but they use, they refer to his theories in their language, they might say. This is, uh, you know, this behaviour is repressed, or they might say, uh, um, this or that is, uh, you know, anal, anal, that person's anally retentive, or they use the language all the time. Um, so I, I think I just understood very young that he was uh, part of all of us, really. I mean, I learned, so I had to share him very young, that everyone was uh, influenced by him, and maybe refer to him particularly in the media because you could turn on the telly or open a book and they might make a reference to Freudian theory so you saw your name or everywhere all the time and knew it was referring to this great sacred monster because they love him or they hate him but they never stop talking about him What do you know that uh, is special about him. Did you miss not having no him personally? Well, you know, I was brought up from, you know, a young age, brought up by, well, I had much contact with his um, son Ernst and his Ernst wife Lucy. They're my grandmother and grandfather, my paternal grandmother and grandfather. And um, when I was age five, they chose a primary school for me and so they it was quite away from my house it was in St John's Wood they lived in St John's Wood Terrace and it was almost next door like three minutes walk so they they met me from the bus they took me to school they collected me from school took me to their house for tea and cupcakes and <laughs> Austrian pastries actually yeah. Danish pastries I call them and so at this period they were editing Sigmund Freud's diaries and so, of course, I felt I knew Sigmund Freud through them talking about him because they were writing uh, a lot of uh, material, transcribing a lot of material from his diaries to make a book you know, called Sigmund Freud's Diaries. So, no, I don't feel I missed him. I feel I had uh, a great deal to do with him from an age before I could understand really any of the theories. Mm. Of course I would have liked to have met him, but... <laughs> 
So, the last question. For you, it's a difficult to talk today about art in the classical center. And so, uh, what uh, uh, has changed compared to the modern art? Do you know, I was speaking about this subject um, on Saturday at the Barbican Centre. It was called Origin of Originality, Navigating the Artistic Canon. And it was comparing what contemporary artists do with personal subject matter in contrast to what traditionally artists did, which was to really reference other artists. So it was always referential to the past, whereas more and more contemporary artists are making uh, self-referential work. They're working from their own experience because we live in postmodernism, time of postmodernism, and you're allowed. But the thing that's changed the most is that, whereas before, artists, they weren't expected to talk about their work, they were almost not allowed to talk about their work. Now, well, now, you know, the door's been open. Artists have to um, write statements to get grant funding for the catalogue essays. Um, also, because, you know, the art funding is drying up all over the world. Well, it is in the UK. There's no more art funding, hardly any. So... Um, we've had to speak up for and about art to get the general public to be more interested in it. The media have become more interested because the artists have spoken, the media are able to understand, the language we use isn't so pretentious. We've had to develop a language to speak about our art as artists, which we didn't do before. And nobody in Britain was going to the museums. In Italy, they've always gone to the galleries to see the old masters. In Britain, it had dropped and a massive, um, well, a massive input, I suppose it must have been with funding uh, uh, to build galleries like the Tate Modern. Um, this occurred and, you know, there are queues now at the Tate Modern. At the te contemporary art has people queuing up to go and see it. And that hasn't undermined the uh, masters, the old masters. A Mondrian is still a Mondrian. It didn't diminish it. A Monet is still a Monet. It didn't diminish it. You know, Leonardo is still Leonardo, even though now we have contemporary artists being um, viewed by the masses, by the mass of people that didn't were not interested before, knew nothing about it. They were alienated. And now they're no longer alienated. I think it's a very, very positive thing. It will keep art alive. Keep it functioning. So thank you. That's a pleasure. <laughs>